Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. And um, I'm happy to talk about adult ADEM. And um, I also learned a little bit about baseball, so I don't know anything about baseball, so that was <laughs> very interesting. Um, so um, I'm a neurologist at uh, Mass General, um, living in Boston, and um, this is going to be a brief overview of adult ADEM. So I see adults for a uh, living, and I just wanted to bring you all the way back to the beginning of ADEM, which I think is very interesting. So way back in 1724 was the first recognized case of ADEM, and it was actually in an adult. So um, this was somebody's thesis in the Netherlands, in Leiden, and um, he described a 44-year-old woman with severe headaches, inflammation of the eyes, uh, very interesting deceptive and inconsistent impressions, which we understand today to be hallucinations. Uh, disrupted separations or blurred vision, uh, convulsions or seizures, jumping of the tendons, which is clonus, so when you take the reflexes, a jumping of the, the muscle tendons, and then very great weakness. And then unfortunately, the very first patient um, described actually died of ADEM. And so that leads to the question, what is ADEM? So ADEM has been um, recognized for several centuries now, but it, it was um, described post-measles, described um, after several infections that have come over time. And it only in 1962 was there an autoimmune hypothesis. And that really um, ushered in a new era for ADEM treatment and sort of understanding ADEM in a very different way. And all the epidemiology that we have is really from children. So we don't have very good adult ADEM data because um, to date, the, as Dr. Gorman said, all the criteria have only been um, proposed for children. So we don't have uh, criteria for adults. So we understand the highest incidence to be during childhood, but we say that with a grain of salt because we don't really have the same collaborative um, grouping around adult ADEM. We know that a preceding event is common, so an infection. Um, vaccination gets a bad rap. It's not very common after all. Um, and it's typically what we call monophasic, so it's once. So the good news about ADEM is um, when you have it, that's the, presumably the only time you'll ever have it in your life. Even though it may have consequences, it's not expected to recur. And it's acute and polyfocal. And this is um, a pathology slide of ADEM. And uh, just like Dr. Gorman uh, said, um, this has a distinct pathological finding. Now, we don't do brain biopsy, thankfully, very often at all anymore. But if we were able to do it without consequences, we would see that there's a, a change around the vein. So that's very different than multiple sclerosis. So these are not clinical concepts. These are pathologically distinct <coughs> diseases. It's just we have sometimes difficulty distinguishing them on MRI or in person. And so in adults, um, MS is kind of very much more common when you have a neuroimmunology clinic. And so our challenge is to distinguish MS and uh, relapsing disorders from ADEM. And um, encephalopathy is one of those important differential kind of um, separators. So encephalopathy means that you kind of change your consciousness level reversibly. And that's thought to be much more a harbinger of ADEM and not really common in MS. We also recognize that ADEM can be seasonal, and they think that's because infections may be triggers and certain infections are more common in winter months in temperate climates, so maybe um, you get more ADEM in the winter months. It's a little, di little bit difficult to tell, but that's kind of what's been seen in multiple different geographies around the world. And now, with the new um, um, discovery of MOG antibody, which you'll hear more about um, uh, soon, um, some cases of ADEM actually have a particular antibody. But most cases, we don't have any uh, biomarker whatsoever. Um, so recovery occurs in most people, 80%, but there's a small fraction of people um, who die from ADEM. And um, there are more than nine, so there are nine cohorts that report more than 50 cases. So this is still a rare disorder, um, but when you gather them together, you can only get nine cohorts in the entire world literature where more than 50 people have been um, uh, studied. And I wanted to show you two very brief um, sort of vignettes to show you how it can be difficult in real life to separate what's going on. And so we did a large retrospective study. And uh, these are two cases from it. And I'll just show you. These are two cases which have similarities but turned out to be different diagnoses. So this is an MRI, an axial flare of a 53-year-old man. And this is at the time of onset. And he had weakness, nausea, vomiting, and confusion or encephalopathy after a nonspecific infection. And this was his MRI, one, one sort of slice of the MRI. And after five years, um, nothing additional happened, and that was considered ADAM. <coughs> 
a separate patient, um, 48 year old woman had almost exactly the same clinical onset. So um, gait problems, nausea, vomiting, and confusion. But within just one year of follow-up, um, relapsing disease occurred and that was um, diagnosed as multiple sclerosis. And so um, even though the story may be quite similar and the age may be quite similar, um, the final outcome could be ultimately different. So um, as a, sort of an epidemiologist as well, um, I can tell you there's some uh, controversies and difficulties in the ADAM world and it gets harder sometimes with adults because MS is much more prevalent. So there's no biomarker, which is one of the, um, the really the next steps for ADEM. Um, there are therapeutic um, implications of being correct and being incorrect. So if you have MS, there are approximately 15 FDA approved drugs on the market. But if you have um, ADEM, we don't have even a randomized control trial yet to tell you what the right thing to do is. And of course, we should always be vigilant for aquaporin-4 and MOG antibodies. Now, there is something called multiphasic ADEM, uh, potentially, where ADEM can recur, but it's quite rare, and so that's also a controversy. As I just mentioned, there is not a one way to treat people with ADEM. So there may be um, different approaches by different experts. I think everybody's familiar <laughs> with that. Um, and so um, you can get two people who are um, leading um, experts in the field and come up with different treatment plans. And that can be challenging, particularly for patients. Um, usually we um, recommend oral or IV steroids, but the dose and the duration are unclear. Um, there are off-label therapies. By definition, everything is off FDA label. Um, plasma exchange, <coughs> IVIG, and rituximab are used. And there's no indication right now for the MS drugs. There is a fraction of ADEM patients that go entirely without any medical treatment, and it's not clear if they do uh, worse. So some folks actually go without any of the medications um, available. Um, so this is a paper, I'll just give you a brief um, sort of snapshot of it if you're interested. We have, uh, it was published um, a couple of years back, I'm happy to give you a copy of it. Um, and this is a collaborative effort among four centers, so um, the Boston centers, um, also University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins University, and Washington University. These are all referral centers for neuroimmunological conditions. And um, of all the cohorts I mentioned before, we really don't have a, a U.S. cohort, and so that was kind of a surprise. So a lot of the really good work has come out of Europe and Canada, but we wanted to see what's going on right back in the U.S. And we wanted to compare pediatric and adult onset ADEM. So we know adult onset ADEM exists, but we don't know very much about it. So um, as I mentioned, for uh, academic hospitals, we went back using uh, billing coding, which is um, uh, basically a ICD-9, or International Classification of Disease. ADEM is a distinct diagnosis, and so we end up um, retrospectively going back. And we went back about approximately 20 years at each center. And um, our criteria were that the physician at the time had to have thought this was ADEM. So we did not um, predicate that you had to have encephalopathy or not. It's just the clinician at the time had to believe that this was ADEM and treated that patient as though he or she had ADEM. And that had to be true all the way up until the time of discharge from the hospital. Um, you could revise the diagnosis during the hospitalization and if a different diagnosis ensued, then that person was not in our study. So they had to be, for all intents and purposes, ADEM. So um, this is our study. So actually, um, only half of the people of um, the ADEM diagnoses were children. So we do see adult ADEM, it's real. And um, approximately half were male. Um, the average age and the median age in this group was about 16 and a half years old. And we were able to follow people um, retrospectively for a median of two years. Um, so some people were followed for up to like 18 years, and, but some people um, were followed um, less than even uh, one year. So the average kind of uh, follow-up is two years. Only 61% uh, of our uh, folks in the cohort had encephalopathy, and so that's one of those contentious issues about the criteria. So encephalopathy is um, very important if it exists, but not everyone who clini clinicians are diagnosing with ADEM have encephalopathy. 40% uh, had fevers. Um, some people have headache, and 36% um, had ataxia. We also looked at the imaging, and we did a separate paper on the imaging. And I can tell you, um, some of these imaging characteristics look a little bit like MS, and some of them look totally um, distinct. So um, only 40% had spinal cord involvement. However, not everyone even had a spinal cord image. 
Um, some of the other things around cerebral spinal fluid, so a one note is all oligoclonal bands are thought to be unusual in ADAM. I just mentioned this because I think it's interesting. When you have a large group of centers reporting, it's a little easier to tell, um, tell the world what actually happened among people who were diagnosed with ADAM. So not everybody had ADAM, actually. Um, a seven, 17 people had something that was different than ADAM um, with um, the benefit of retrospection. A couple of people had uh, lymphoma, other people had uh, other autoimmune conditions like lupus, some very rare conditions like SUSAC. Um, a couple of, uh, actually a significant fraction ended up having NMOSD, and then some people had um, MS. So there are also a couple of other things of note, uh, Lyme disease, rabies, um, and some tumors. So just um, keeping one's eyes open as a clinician is extremely important, and that just sort of illustrates that. Uh, we wanted to look how likely are folks to relapse over time. So um, the x-axis at the bottom is the number of years we're following. Basically, um, the number of people who had a relapsing condition of any sort was about a quarter of everyone in the study. And most people who are going to have a relapsing condition did so in about two years. So of people who presented with a relapsing disease, um, ataxia was more common. Um, the things that we consider is like fever, meningitis, those were more likely to associate with a one-time ADEM presentation. And since I was asked to talk about adults versus children, I'll just give you, there's a lot of data here, but I'll just tell you that um, both adults and children did really well, um, but children do um, even better than adults. So that's 95% um, of children did well, and we defined that by a certain functional outcome. Um, we also looked at different uh, other presenting features to see if we could tell them apart. Uh, children are more likely to have encephalopathy. Um, some of the things may be difficult to test, like sensory abnormalities. We may get a better history from adults than kids, because they just can't tell us sometimes their, their symptoms. So on this, I'm just comparing side by side. There's no difference in relapse, um, but I'm going to show you um, a composite analysis. Um, females are more likely to relapse. So I'll just mention that briefly. And people who have uh, no encephalopathy are more likely to relapse. So taken together, if you are younger, if you're female, and if you don't have encephalopathy, you're more likely to relapse um, in the long term. Now, this is not set in stone. It, you, know, you could have all these risk factors, and you may never relapse. But we're just trying to tease out, in finally a large data set, what are the real risk factors <coughs> in ADEM for future disease activity. I can tell you in our cohort, we had a lot of different treatments, but these were the main ones. Um, IV steroids were kind of the standard, and some folks got IVIG and plasma exchange. But Im importantly, 10% got no treatment whatsoever. So these are kind of the, f the, the findings. Relapsing disease is relatively common, so about a quarter of our, our patients did have a relapse. Sometimes the diagnosis was revised, many times it wasn't. Um, competing diagnoses are not uncommon, so everyone has to really be paying attention, not just at the time of diagnosis, but also in the longer term for the type of um, disease and continuing to think about um, who's in front of them. Um, there are differences between adults and kids, and um, a subset of features may be helpful for um, making prognostication. Um, I'll just tell you that it's difficult to do a study like this because um, this is a, a rare condition. Um, we think that these hospitals are attracting um, more difficult, more serious cases. Um, you know, when people were seeing the patients, they didn't know, you know, 10 years ago they were going to end up in a study, so everyone was doing what their best judgment was. Um, and there were no, um, at the time that some of these cases were um, collected, we didn't have the aquaporin for <laughs> antibody or the MOG antibody in place. So now we have those, so future studies will be even better. And just to um, kind of close off, I'll just give you this one other kind of um, uh, hopefully uh, interesting study that we did. We wanted to compare um, Asia versus the US. So we know ADEM is a global um, problem, and so um, it's often thought that Asians have a higher proportion of um, um, NMO versus MS, and so we also wanted to look at ADEM. So we did a very a kind of a parallel study in three uh, large hospitals in Asia, and we wanted to compare them to the US. And we standardized the same number of kids so we assume that there are 35% kids in both cohorts. And to make a very long story short, um, 
I will just tell you that um, there were more people with spinal cord involvement in Asia identified, and um, for reasons that we're not sure on yet, there were more people in the U.S. that had preceding ad events identified. So one hypothesis is that maybe um, ADAM is really a first presentation of NMO in Asian populations, at least sometimes, and more likely a first presentation of MS in some Caucasian po uh, populations. And so there could be genetic uh, differences to the susceptibility to spinal cord involvement that's totally um, unexplored right now, but very interesting. Um, so they're both host and infectious and um, uh, other factors that we're still understanding. So they may differ depending on what infection you got or where you are or what your genetics already are. And this just tells you no matter where you are, um, your risk of a relapse is the same if you're in Asia or if you're in the U.S. So um, the clinicians are thinking similarly and the disease is behaving similarly across hemispheres. So um, to conclude, um, uh, risk of relapsing uh, disease is ac uh, similar across uh, geographical settings. I would argue we need age-specific guidelines. So the uh, International Pediatric uh, uh, Study Group has done a very good job of coming up for uh, criteria for children. The adult folks need to get on, the, on board and do the same. We need to have criteria for adult ADEM, otherwise we'll never really be able to do large-scale epidemiological studies, um, never have the same definition for ADEM for trials, and we need uh, continuing biomarker development. Um, you know, I would argue we need a registry for ADEM. We don't collect them um, as a group of um, clinicians or scientists, but that would be really helpful for the future. And um, some questions about emerging therapies are also relevant to ADEM, and they need to be tried. So um, with that, I'll thank you. I recognize uh, one of the graduate students who helped um, perform this work and um, all the collaborators across um, many different hospitals to make the data uh, come together. So thank you very much.